O Lord, open our hearts to hear and receive your word so that growing by the strength of your word and spirit in our lives, we would be strengthened in our witness to the world. All this we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Today I had a bit of a rough go yesterday as I was trying to figure out which text to preach on because each one of them is a very rich text as you listen to them and read, on, read through them. And I really encourage you to take them home over the week and use them during your day, times of daily devotions, whether it's in the morning or noon or at night or all three. They're all very good ones for us to chew on. So, for example, the book of Acts, where Peter receives this strange vision of this cloth coming down out of heaven, and he hears the voice of God saying, kill and eat, as all as a way to prepare Peter for something that was a bit earth-shattering during the day and age in which he was living. The Lord had intended the gospel to be for all people, and no one was to be considered unclean. And here along the way, the good Lord gave him this, this vision in order to show him that Yes, even the gospel was intended not only for the children of the Israelites, but also for all people, and in this case, the Gentiles, Greeks that came to seek Peter for that gospel message. It's a reminder for us as we undergo our own work of witness to the world that as we take a look at evangelism, there is no one beyond the pale of the gospel message. In the way that we sing that Jesus Christ takes away the sin of the whole world as we get ready for, ce for celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so it's a reminder for us that evangelism, outreach, witnessing is for everyone. There's no one excluded. Second reading from Revelation is another beautiful passage again. Here from the end of the book where John is reminded that as we look at who we are as Christians, we are there as a part of that new Jerusalem and the reminder that the church is nothing else other than the dwelling place of God among our humanity. And the way that it was written in, in John's time is a reminder for us, not only for the future when Jesus comes again and we're ushered into heaven, but also even for us now as we continue to wrestle and struggle through you know, all of the things that we have within our hearts and in our minds and the way in which the, well, the world mocks the gospel and mocks the church as a result. God's presence is among us, even as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today. But for today, I wanted to focus on the first half of the gospel reading. Yes, Jesus is talking about, well, a little while you won't see me, and a little while you will, and this was written before the time of his crucifixion, and so Jesus was referring to his rest in the tomb. But he's also talking about that joy and that full knowledge of Christ, which is given to us not only through the words of Scripture, but also the working of the Holy Spirit. So even though we're a few weeks out from Pentecost, I couldn't resist but talking about that today. People love talking about the Holy Spirit, especially in many different groups, and it seems to be no end of splinter groups along the way that claim that they have the latest vision of what God wants for the church today because the Holy Spirit told them this. I know talking with our African friends and you know, comparing the way in which some of these preachers go on and on about this is the latest thing that God wants to tell you through this inspired preacher that we see it happening even here in North America. There's no end of churches and preachers that will pull out that Holy Spirit trump card saying, but God told me and so I'm going to tell you and now along the way this is what you have to do in order to get the latest little bit of what the Holy Spirit is trying to accomplish. And so, you have everything from preachers that build a charismatic following around them and them alone as this person who has all inspired truth, all contained within their own hearts, so that unless you follow them and send them all your money, that God will not bless you, all these things along the way. Or then you have others which will go on and on about, well, you know you really have the Holy Spirit when? Well, the list can go on when you see miracles when you're slain in the spirit, when you speak in holy tongues or holy laughter. That was another one that went around for a while. And there's always new ones that are being dreamt up in order to give the best and the latest show for people to think maybe this is something that God is doing, even though with the exception of tongues, Scripture speaks of none of them. And even the tongues that Scripture speaks of, it's not this babbling on and on in some weird kind of a language, but... It's the actual speaking of real languages that people understood there. 
And even St. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, reminded them about that, saying, you know, if you're just babbling on, it's best you do that quietly by yourself. And instead, we focus on speaking the Word of God clearly. Now, here Jesus reminds us a number of things about what the Holy Spirit is about to do. And yes, he was pointing forward to Pentecost on the day in which the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and the people where not only did he dispel all of the fear and the worries of the apostles as they wondered what the good Lord was up to, even as they saw him after the resurrection so many times, they still kept meeting behind locked doors because they weren't quite sure what this mission of the church and what our good Lord was accomplishing. And yet, here on that Pentecost day, we call it the birthday of the church, the Lord poured out the Holy Spirit so that they could preach the word with boldness, understanding what it was that Christ had done. And we see the rest of that unfold in the letters of the New Testament as each of the apostles write to different communities, different churches, in order to lead them into all truth. But the truth that he's talking about here, that Jesus is mentioning about the Holy Spirit, is not ever something that is different from the rest of what God has spoken in Scripture. That's something we need to always remember and keep in mind. The danger in the world today with many of these so-called preachers that have the Holy Spirit, and it was present in the New Testament as well, and Paul and Peter and John, all of these apostles, even Jude warn against them, is that they take an element of God's word and then they twist it around and then they say, but here's the real meaning, even though the rest of Scripture speaks against it. Each of the apostles rightly warned the first Christians, and we are warned in the same way, that that isn't the Holy Spirit. Instead, as Jesus says today, the Holy Spirit takes whatever Jesus says and declares it to us. The Holy Spirit turns us back to Christ, not to some of his own work. The Holy Spirit turns us back to our Savior where that gift of salvation and forgiveness is poured out into our lives time and time again, all through the death and the resurrection of our Savior. And he never takes us away from that. So anytime that we hear someone going on and preaching about the Holy Spirit without mentioning Christ except as a little bit of a backdrop or a springboard along the same way, if they're not talking about and preaching the message which leads us back to the cross, back to our Savior. That isn't the Holy Spirit at work in that life. That's why Paul, writing later on, he talks about how many spirits have gone out into the world and not all of them are from God. And he says that we ought to test the spirits as we listen to these various preachers. And by that, what he means is not that we go and spend a lot of time in fervent prayer so that along the way, we kind of wonder inside of our own hearts without any anchor other than our own inward feelings that, that we wonder whether it is God's spirit. No, when Paul writes about that, he says we test the spirits by going back to Scripture because Scripture is the inspired Word of God through whom the Holy Spirit speaks to us today. And the Spirit never speaks with a forked tongue. In other words, the Holy Spirit will never say something different from what he's already taught. But instead, he will lead us to engage that in a deeper and deeper sense. As the Word of God comes and confronts us with our own brokenness in order to lead us back to Christ our Savior, so that the Holy Spirit comes through that same word in order to lead us back to Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, so that like branches grafted into the vine, we have life in him and in his name because Jesus is the one that came to be our redeemer, our savior, the one who died on the cross, the one who took our humanity there and entered into our death in order to give us that life all by his resurrection from the dead. As we're reminded not only here in John's gospel, but then later on in John's letters, it's the Holy Spirit that bears testimony to that simple truth to lead us always back to the one who has died to save us, the one who is risen from the dead, and the one who continues to be present here in his word, but also in the sacraments. And then, yes, through the sacraments, also in the members of this body of Christ in the church, so that all together we are here to encourage one another 
And that same faith points them to Jesus, our Savior. These words of Jesus need to be taken to heart. And I know we don't often talk about the Holy Spirit because we do talk so much about Christ and for the simple reality that Jesus is the one who is our Savior. The Holy Spirit never died for us, but Jesus did. At the same time, it doesn't mean that Scripture doesn't tell us what the Holy Spirit is up to or what the Holy Spirit will do. If we tie together other passages, yes, he helps us in our prayers, the way Paul writes. Yes, he leads us in repentance, as Jesus will say later on in John's Gospel, as we hear more and more about this ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that repentance is always a turning back to God in Jesus Christ, all through the forgiveness of our sins, where we have that entrance into heaven. But as we're reminded today, and it's laced throughout the rest of Scripture as well, Holy Spirit's job is always to turn us back to the simple word of God which we have received from Christ our Lord through the apostles, not to something different or new. It's very easy for us in our day and age to keep chasing after those new things and various light shows because after all, our society is always looking for a little bit of a buzz or a little bit of a high. That's why, as we take a look at it, it's not only the drugs on the street that people go chasing after in order to get that experience, but it's so many other ways and places. Take a look at how many restaurants open and then close very quickly because, well, the crowd tried it and now they found someplace new, right? Or take a look at how many different kinds of concerts and shows there are, and the latest type of show has to be better, better and different. And that's why on TV you always hear everybody saying, this is the best season ever and most exciting season of this particular show, when really, if you were to compare it from previous seasons, they're basically doing the same thing, right? But we have to convince others that it's going to be more exciting than last time. Same danger exists in our spiritual lives where we chase a buzz or something new rather than our Savior. No, the Holy Spirit's job is not to teach us something different from what has already been given, but always to cement us back into that living relationship with our living and resurrected Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in a world where people like to chase after these things and these different forms of spirituality, and we can put bunny ears around them because there are so many of them out there, we need to recognize that most of them are built on the sense of inwardness and intuition and chasing your feelings or somehow chasing your feelings as interpreted by some sort of a preacher who claims to be inspired. No, we are taught here by our Savior that we chase the Spirit by digging into the Word. And that the Holy Spirit's job is to come into our lives in order, yes, to help us wrestle with our sins, but most importantly, to bring us back to our Savior, who is the one that gives us that new life. So that as we hear these words today, we're reminded that it is really all about the work that Jesus has done, and the Holy Spirit is there simply to point us back to that. So that as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, He works to break down all the ways in which we chase after things in order to chase those spiritual highs or whatever they might be, that adrenaline rush in whatever shape it takes, or the way in which we try to protect ourselves and guard ourselves against things that might hurt, even though sometimes as the Holy Spirit works, you know, sometimes we have to confront our own brokenness. He does that never to leave us down in the dust or down in the dirt, but always to bring us back to the source of our life, the wellspring of our salvation, that Lamb who sits on the throne, that Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who became human for us, took on our brokenness, and then to fill us with His life. Get ready to celebrate Pentecost. Jesus here reminds us about that wonderful gift and ministry that the Holy Spirit is to perform. 
So today we're also reminded, don't be led astray by strange ideas. But instead, test the spirits. Dig back into the word. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who died for you and rose for you, the one who took all of your brokenness and crushed it on the cross, all to give us that new gift of life so that we have that presence of God within our lives, even here today, and that it extends into eternity so that we can rejoice that Jesus is and is with us. You know, in church, we say those words, the Lord be with you, right? We all respond, it's not May the 4th, where may the 4th be with you, may the 4th be with you, although Lutherans respond and also with you to that, don't they? Um, no, but it, this is where we greet one another, and as we listen to that, we so often let those words gloss over our lips without really thinking what it is that we're saying and as we're greeting one another. It's there in the liturgy, and so we say it, right? Well, what we're saying to one another is, is we're wishing the Lord's presence into each other's lives, and so as we respond, we say, the Lord be with you also. And as we say those words, we reaffirm that simple truth and reality. That through baptism, Jesus said he'd be with us to the very end of the age, right? Through baptism, we're reminded that we have been joined with Christ and that we are baptized into Christ so that we're clothed in Christ and we are all members of that same body together. We're greeting one another as fellow Christians. Along with that, we speak words of grace as well. We're speaking about the work that the Holy Spirit has done. And so today, as we greet one another, even after the service, let's greet one another in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, saying, the Lord be with you and rejoice. Amen. Please stand. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which you've poured out into our lives all through our baptism. And we thank you that that same Spirit continues to speak into our hearts and into our lives through your word so that we are never wondering and guessing what it is that you have to communicate for us. But instead, through that same word, you always point us back to our Savior, recognizing that these things are written so that we may believe in Jesus as our Savior, as the Christ who died and rose again. Bless us in our witness and guide us in our devotion so that as we dig more and more into your word that we would be strengthened in that faith, and more and more cemented into that very life and death and resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ so that strengthened by his witness to us that we would be strengthened in our witness to one another and to the world. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, by the strength of your Spirit, 